Okay, so today we're going to keep going on about the chapter 13 uh, in the machine learning. And then today we're going to wrap up the chapter 13. So I hope that, yeah, we can wrap it up because the rest of the part is uh, quite kind of more like a technical part of the uh, deep learning kind of a uh, uh, technique and process. So anyway, so just kind of a little bit brief cover about the cause the last yesterday, uh, the last bit, I mean, we actually have uh, this, uh, this data set. And then uh, we also briefly talk about the how DNA network, uh, like a, a neural, uh, a deep neural network, actually how it works and then how what is the look like like an input layer and hidden layer and output layer so a little bit more detail about about that diagram we're gonna start looking at the network uh, architecture in here so as you can see here network architecture actually have uh, two features like a layers and node and activation function i mean so when we talk about the layer and nodes, actually in layer, we actually have a two main type of the layer to consider, which is the hidden and output layer. Because input layer is a just kind of a low, kind of a original predictor variable, because it is just kind of a better of the, our raw data set we're going to use to for the DNN. So the the main part of the main part of the layer we have to really thinking about for the DNN technique is the hidden layer and output layers. So actually in here it says about that there is a well defined approaches to selecting the number of a hidden layer at the nodes. So that means depending on the, our kind of our data set and then what kind of uh, input features we have right here, maybe input. Based on these kind of context, there is a maybe, maybe one layer can be happen or maybe two or three or even four or five kind of a hidden layer can be possible depending on the how complicated our data gonna be, okay? So that means that there is a no defined approaches to the how many number of uh, hidden layer we need. It just uh, depending on our input layer. And also, it generally says about the just kind of a regular kind of a table layer, like just our rule of thumb is uh, mostly between two to five. And then, and then also under the under the each hidden layer actually have also have a there are different kind of a node that represents the kind of a features, all the features that we wanted to analyze under the that layer. So those kind of things. And also, it also says about, this one is very interesting. So open, the number of nodes of the each layer are gonna be equal or less than number of features. So that means, Sometimes we actually have a uh, under the each layers, mo mostly number of number of uh, node actually represents about the number of uh, features we are gonna try to understand or analyze. But sometimes depending on the situation, it is not a hard kind of requirement. So that means maybe if we have a kind of a four features we have to analyze under the these hidden layers. Maybe sometimes we can actually that four features can be reflected as a kind of a three different kind of nodes can be enough. Okay. Or maybe we can setting up the four uh four nodes that represents to the four uh four features. Usually I think that in mostly we try to set up the equal of the number of the features gonna be the number of nodes, but sometimes it might be possible maybe we can do more than that or maybe less than that. So that means it is very flexible to how many 
those will also need to be defined under the each layer. Okay. So that's the hidden layers is about. And then output layer is the just kind of our after the training and modeling one. And then we can get the, our output. So that means I think that this part, uh, Ricardo uh, briefly explained about output layers uh, last week. So what is the, this one is kind of like, uh, in, in case of the regression problem, maybe our output layer gonna be the only final predict value, which is the only single load gonna be included, which represents the depth, which contains the depth predict value. But in case of the classification problem, depending on the how many categories we have to uh, generate for the our output, that's gonna be determined the number of uh, nodes. So in case like a binary output, like a two or force kind of problem, maybe we only contain the one single node that only contains about the yes or no kind of uh, output. But if we have any kind of a multiple kind of a category we have to present, that means our predict outcome or output variable gonna be the multiple classes should be represented. So that means the number of nodes under the output layer is the equal to the number of categories we have to predict. So that means it in in this case in our uh predicting the our digits uh prediction kind of cases, we have to pre uh, predict the ten classes like a zero to zero to nine. That means we are gonna have a like a maybe 10, 10 output classes, like uh, this one is output layer, because this one is a zero, one, two through nine. And then each node has kind of a binary kind of output, uh, each, each, no, no, not the binary, each output layer gonna be have a kind of a probability of the, of the, that num uh that read handwriting number gonna be uh gonna be equal to the that that class like a like a point one five or maybe in this case point eight zero etc. In this case, that handwriting gonna be read read as a one based on our handwrite, our DNN technique. So in this case, we have a 10 different classes, but the thing is we gonna, we gonna have a, each probability of the, each class. So, so the likelihood of the, uh, that handwriting number gonna be the belonging to the some specific digital digit number. That's the output layer is about. So depending on our problem, it can be the one node as a binary or or predicted outcome or it might be the multiple cases which represents about the each node represents about the probability of the each class. Okay. So any questions so far? Anything? Uh can uh, yeah. 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 Uh uh, remember that we talked last time that we talked about the Keras uh, uh -huh. package that you're going to talk, you know, uh, next. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, here. Regarding regarding that, this week there was uh -huh. an announcement from the the Keras group uh -huh. uh, that they are including also uh, PyTorch. Oh, uh, okay. For, yeah. For the, for the back end. Uh -huh. Okay. The, the product is called a uh, Keras Keras Core. Uh, core. So now, uh, apart from TensorFlow, uh, they're adding the, the PyTorch uh, back end, okay? So that's something that, uh, you know, it, it updates our our discussion in the last in the last session. Uh, okay. Yeah, here, like a CARES package also gonna be include the PyTorch, right? 
And then I think that in R, there is also a package called Torch, right? In Correct. R. Yeah. yeah. So PyTorch is a kind of a is a is a kind of a language in Python. And then and then I also realized that the torch is done uh, R packages that allows us to use the Depari torch in R. Mm -hmm. So yes. and then uh, maybe by integrating the Decares packages, maybe we can actually have a uh, more powerful packages that supports to the the uh, deep learning kind of techniques. So I heard mm -hmm. that there might be the our there might be the study club that gonna study about the that torch things, but <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think there's one that is uh you know beginning soon. Yeah. Mm, okay. Are you gonna are you gonna took that course uh took that study club? Uh me? Yeah. Uh not not yet. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, because I want to uh, I want to give priority to an another book club <laughs> right now that we're trying oh, to okay try, try, trying to start. Yeah, it's for yeah. it's uh, the the master in shiny uh, book club. Yeah. Ah, oh, master in shiny. Yeah, I also yep. think about taking yeah joining the book club because I also mm -hmm. want to right and know about the shiny app because our part is the shiny app is sure. another good <laughs> good. Techniques we have to learn, especially for the those kind of interactive kind of app kind of development. So, okay, so I would like, I would like okay. to start a uh, master in shiny with you, and maybe to start a cohort just after uh, this book. Uh huh. Because I think uh, all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we 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 are trying to start it by the by the beginning of October. Okay. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you know we, we have we have time to at least you know uh, progressing in this one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. 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 So I think that oh hold on. I think that we how many chapters we left here, I guess. Uh we uh still have a lot of things to do, but yeah, mm -hmm. I think that yeah, we maybe yeah, we can try to yeah, try to finish in this one yeah, as quickly as possible and then uh, try to move to the dead part. That might be awesome. But anyway, yeah. So I'm going to take in the dead, maybe that course, because that, that one is the study club I really want to yeah, join. So mm -hmm. yeah, I hope that that's going to be happen soon. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So now okay. we actually thinking about the uh, how we can implement that DNN kind of a technique, right? By using the our sample. So let's see the R code then. Okay. So in here we are gonna use the CARES package, and then this one is actually allows us to develop the, our network to the layering approaches. So what you can do is the, we actually set up the what is called the model sequencer kind of approaches. So, so that means uh, in the previous chapter, like a feed for DNN, we actually saw about the here is the input layer. And then uh, maybe if we have uh, this kind of a hidden layer and then output layer is like this, it is actually kind of a linear kind of a sequencer kind of a process, like a forward. One is done, and then the next, and then the next, and the next, and then I'll get to the outcome, right? So we actually set up about the, this kind of sequence of kind of things, and then adding start adding the that some of the dense hidden layers. So in this case, we actually creating uh, creating the two hidden layers. For uh first layer gonna be the one hundred twenty eight nodes, and then the second one is the six. 64 and then the final one going to be the output layer with the 10 node because in here so first one is uh, we actually have a number of a union means that we actually can determine about the number of nodes under the each layer so this one actually have a hidden layer one and then this one is hidden layer two and then this one is output and then we can actually set up the model sequencer 
in the, uh, in the at the beginning of the model. So this one is how very very basic kind of a DNN analysis modeling training look like. Okay, we just uh, setting up the layer and then define the how many nodes we gonna thinking about, and then we also detonating about the what the input shape is about number of column for the at least x which is uh, this one is i i would say about the the shape kind of a features things with the same for the this amount of the node i guess so that's the how we can try to try to do because in here input shape is the equal the number of features on your data set Okay, and then we can actually have a 128 kind of a nodes, and then we can define the that hidden layer one and two and output, etc. And then now we have to activation. So in here, activation is uh, another key components of the how we can uh, in the model. So that means in here actually authors compare the activation is to the human brain. So that means whenever we have a kind of a certain threshold beyond the, our input is accumulate the third, uh, certain threshold, our neuron gonna be activated to recognize the, those things as a signal, okay? DNN that work also the same, uh, same passion. So that means each node connect in here, it is activator function means each node actually connected the old nodes with the previous layer in the in the previous layer. So that means maybe whenever we have a uh, one node in here in the certain maybe hidden layer or whatever, that node actually have a have a node network with the older node in the previous uh previous layer like this so this one is maybe i will say about the hidden layer maybe two that means hidden layer one each node in the under the hidden node hidden layer two gonna be connected by the older node is the hidden layer one to re recognize the recognize what that things is about in the previous chat uh, previous uh, layers and then Whenever we have a, this kind of a node uh, network, each node actually have a weight. So that means kind of a, uh, it is actually calculated by the, these kind of a weights about the uh, kind of a, some parameter or some of the uh, intermediate kind of a predicted outcome. And then whenever we uh, have a kind of a, that info function, like a, like a this one, and then the activation function gonna be the, we can determine about the, based on the this weight, we can actually determine about the, what's the probability of the each things, depending on the these things. And then we can get to the output in this case. So, so that means in here is a kind of a mathematical function. So about the, so identify means uh, linear means is kind of a predicted number kind of things. Fx is equals x. And then a rectify linear union is kind of a, there is a, some certain threshold. There is a kind of a negative or positive. In that case, negative means we have a just setting to the zero. And then it is a positive, we just kind of get the dead number by itself. Or sigmoid is a kind of a, this one is actually, whenever we actually pass is EX plus one to the EX, right? This one is actually odd ratio, kind of a, kind of function. So which means uh, like a likelihood or a probability of the, some kind of a possibility for the, that, that certain predict value. And then softmax, softmax is also the same thing. Like uh, all of the these kind of a uh, percentage probability divided by the that specific number of uh, number of uh, those area. So that 
is a kind of how we can activate in these things. So this one is actually just kind of what is called a kind of a literally training the our model based on the activation, activating the data uh, when we activate the node under the each layers. Okay. So each layer is actually have uh, this kind of activation function and then a node gonna be work work based on the these kind of a uh, function uh, mathematical function approaches. So and then and then we actually have an implementation like this. So now we have a activation argument like a 128 nodes with uh, what kind of a linear functions we're gonna be set up. In this case, REAU is the rectifies the linear unit functions, and then input shape gonna be the P like a number of uh, our features and here, and then output gonna be the softmax kind of things like estimate the probability of the each class gonna be uh, uh, some certain output gonna be belonging to the each specific digitizing number in this case, okay? So these are the kind of uh, example of the, how we can setting up the activation by using the activation argument under the this layer dense kind of function. Okay. And then now we also talk, we now, what is the important concept of the DNN is the, what is called the back propagation. So <clears throat> back propagation is the kind of, like a, kind of like a, uh, improving, improving the, our training model process. That's the, that's the brief summary of the, of the, of the, this back propagation. So whenever we have a kind of a, kind of a batch of the observation and then a randomly assigned the weight and then a, a all connection, et cetera. And then we can get the kind of a, uh, kind of output and then uh, there is also kind of error gonna be happen like uh, accuracy kind of things and then whenever we actually done with the each kind of a batch function which is the whole whole kind of a set of the set of the DNA gonna be done for the one single observation like each observation we have to keep training the our model how we can keep training those model it gonna be done by the automatically adjusting the this weight across the all the nodes. So that means whenever we have uh, these kind of things and then a node can be linked and then uh, these are the weight gonna be calculating based on the, the mathematical function we mentioned in the previous section. And then whenever this one actually done for the each observations, whenever we start here based on the based on the error of the previous batch, I would say like a batch previous uh, execution, we actually adjusting the weight. That is what is called a back, uh, back propagation. So that means going back to the that error that going back to the first and then, uh, and then uh, uh, at the same time, we're gonna adjusting the, those kind of errors, okay? So back propagation actually need the two things, which means the observation, ob objective function and then optimizer. So like we said, optimizer means kind of a literally about the optimizing the our uh, DNA kind of a network by adjusting the this weight for the each batch gonna be executed. Okay, each observation gonna be going through those DNA kind of a uh, process and then uh, every time each observation going through the this DNN and then uh, whenever we go back uh, back to the beginning and then uh, learn that again before doing that we uh, this model automatically adjusting the this kind of uh, weights depending on the that observations and then uh, and then uh, those gonna be adjusted based on the, those kind of uh, weights to to recognize the that another another new observation next to the observation more accurately. So that's the how we how we can say about the back propagation. So in here so it, it in here so each forward pass DNA gonna be measured each performances. 
like a loss function kind of a choosing. So if each whenever we have a one single observation gonna be executed by the DNN, there is also loss function gonna be calculated. And then whenever we have to that work backward to the back to the layer and then uh, compute to the that gradient kind of a loss functions. And then we're gonna try to keep minimizing the those kind of loss uh, values by adjusting the those weight to improving the that uh that accuracy. So that's the how this one is works. Okay. So in here authors actually mention about uh, there is a uh, some of the technical differences among the how we can try to do the this kind of a gradient descent kind of a function to estimate the loss function and then minimizing it. But in here, actually authors are just using about the default optimizer, but I, in here it actually says about that there is a different kind of a, these kind of optimizers and then a, these backpropagation kind of a technique that allows us to the improving the this DNN kind of a network process. Okay, so to do that, we just uh, kind of, what we can do is uh, just kind of a matter of adding another things for the back propagation kind of a process gonna be defined under the under the that layer definition. So after the network architecture, we also setting up the back propagation like this by using the compile kind of a function arguments. And then the loss function is gonna be the categorical cross and cross entropy means kind of like a, whenever we have a classification problem, we actually calculating about the, that ent entropy kind of a level of the chaos, like a level of a loss function gonna be uh, uh, estimated for the each observation gonna be processed through the DNN. And then optimizer, we also setting up like a deport and then a matrix is the accuracy. So how accurate we can predict uh, our outcome that based on the that criteria, these kind of option allows R to calculate the those loss function and then uh, keep trying to improve, improving the, our model so that we can get the minimized, minim minimum value of the loss function outcome, okay? So now 13.6 is about the, how we can try to model training. So whenever you actually going through the, all of the, these R code, it is actually kind of a matter of the adding the, adding the options kind of things to get the model is better. Cause so far when, what we actually do is just kind of keep adding the, these kind of a, like a back propagation or defining the network, the net, uh, structures, we can actually building up the, our training model, okay? So in here, the things, the, the things we actually setting up for the model training is the like of, in here it says about the four different kind of a components. Actually the purpose is not that important because this one is actually, I would say about the optional kind of things because this one is just only kind of showing about the live updates of the dev functions in the R studio. So every time the observation going through the, this kind of a DNN process, we can uh, we can get the result of the loss function. So that means how many values we have. And then whenever we get to the point about the loss function gonna be the flatten out, which means the uh, loss function became the constants uh, through, the, through the number of batches or epoch kind of things the worst gonna be the constant in there is a certain amount of points. So first of all is the batch sizes. So batch sizes is kind of a number of a batch data set to, to do the, this kind of a process. So that means we can actually setting up about the each observation, whenever we actually going through the each observation for the DNN, we can actually calculate the loss function. But this one actually computationally very takes a long time. Cause if we have a kind of a 1 million kind of observation to training our model, that means our loss function gonna be calculate the 10 million, uh, 
10 million times. If we can setting up the batch size is one, which means like a one batch size of the data set. One each each observation gonna be going through the DNN, we can calculate the loss function. But that is a computation is very extensive. So we can actually setting up the like a, maybe I would say about the 10 or 100 or maybe a thousand as a kind of a, a group of the data set for the batch. So that is a kind of a group. And then whenever it this one going to the DNN up to the um, um for the all of the this group, uh that means we actually calculating the dead one. So maybe if uh, if observation is the batch of size is gonna be 10. So every every after the 10 observations, we actually estimate about the this kind of a loss function by using the sum of the averaging or whatever. Okay. So in here it says about the rule of thumb of the dispatch size is the memory requirement of the CPU or graphic card RAM. Like the 32, 64, 120 or 8, 22, 256 and so on. So like a based on the how many how many memory size we all actually occupy to using the batch size that actually determine about the number of uh, number of a batch size and then the data within the that batch should be determined. And then the epoch means is kind of like a number of times of the algorithms is in the entire data set. So that means in here, if we have a six, 60,000 observation learning batches of the 128, that means we have a 60,000 divided by 128 actually 48.75, which is the almost the 49 times, okay? So to go through the entire data set by the, by the one, pet, uh, one batch consisting of the 128, that means we have to go through the 49 times of the epoch, okay? That should be the necessary. Uh, 469 times should be uh, should be consisting of the one one epoch to to go through the entire data set okay this one is a kind of a can be can be calculating automatically based on the number of observation divided by the batch size that actually determine about the, how many passes we have to go through for the one epoch okay? And then the validation spread is the we also holding out the percentage of our data set to get to the more accurate kind of estimate and then purpose is the library updates. So as you can see at the bottom in here, so now we have a kind of a set of the options to train the model by using the fit function, which is the modeling kind of a output. So X is the this one and the Y is that. And then the epoch is the 25 in this case, and then the batch size is the 128. And then the validation is the 20% of the data. We actually calculating about the validations over the outcome. And then whenever we plotting the uh plotting the this kind of a modeling uh outcome, we can get to the point of the this kind of a training and validation outcome. So here, the left one is actually kind of a training. And then ACC is a kind of a accuracy, kind of a uh, estimation. Loss function is uh, just literally about the error functions, okay? And then when we're looking at the, these kind of things, we can actually find that uh, maybe around in here, like a 7.5 or 8 epoch, so whenever we actually going through the our entire data set about the eight times or something, our accuracy tends to be the more like a flatten out. In this case, so that means maybe if we can go through the entire data set more than eight times, our accuracy level and loss function gonna be more constant. 
so no change. So that means this kind of eight times gonna be the our, I would say about the threshold kind of, kind of epoch point that we can try to do this. That's how we can read this kind of plot, okay? And then now next time is actually, as you can see here, this one is actually basic kind of a training the model process. So next time, like a 13.7 is just kind of a matter of 13.7 and eight is a kind of a matter of the tuning and then how we can diagnosis for the our DNN training model. So first one is kind of a model tuning. So model tuning gonna be uh, 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 made through the, these kind of a four different kind of a steps. One is the adjusting the model capacity and then a batch normalization, regularization, and then adjust the learning base. So in case of the model capacity, that means we actually try to try to do the uh, calculating about the, some of the, these kind of a different kind of a scenarios, okay? So we actually, depending on the how many layers we can setting up and then how what's the batch size we can determine, like a small, medium, large, and then we can actually calculating about the loss function in this case. And then based on the, these loss functions, we actually try to determine the what's the what's the best layer size and then uh, what's the best layer number of layer, hidden layer at the same time batch size we can uh, perform the best in our training model okay so under under the here as you can see we can actually calculating about the, this kind of a training and validation error like a loss function and then uh, in this case we, we actually found that uh, maybe single layer for the 200, uh, 256 kind of a node can have a lowest kind of a error term, but it's uh, quite similar to the two layer, two hidden layer and three hidden layer is also pretty the similar level of the error uh, in this case, okay? So this one is uh, one of one of the technique for the uh, model tuning. So how what, how many layers and then how many batch how much how big batch size we gonna define for the model. And then the other one is a batch normalize uh, batch. I would say batch normalization. And then batch normalization is a kind of a what is say about the uh, just kind of uh, generating the normalizing the our data, adaptively normalizing the data as a mean or variance changes over time during the training. So it is actually better about the calculating the these kind of a mean and changes, because uh, whenever we have a we have a, have a number of observation for the each each batch, that means. We can actually calculate about the loss function for uh, within the that each or uh, loss function of the each observation, and then uh, within the that batch, we can actually calculating about the mean or variance changes over time for the each observation going to the DNN, and then uh, those are things we actually calculating about the about the normalization. So. That means in the, in this case, the depth of the, our network is uh, gonna be increases. So batch, batch normalization gonna be the more important. And then that actually determined about the, our accuracy of the model. So what we can do in this case is every, every layer going through, we actually try to normalization of the batch, like each cases like these two, the hidden layer one, hidden layer two, and then this one is the output. Even the output layer gonna, before we get to the output layer, we each layer go, going through being processed, we actually setting up the, this kind of a normalization functions. And then that normalization function actually allows us, allows us to the adjusting the, these kind of error terms, okay? And then, when we looking at the, this one, 
Now we can find that the largest large batch size with the three hidden layer can give us the minimum validation error, which is the quite quite a good fit. But the thing is, it is a still kind of things uh, showing that uh, it is kind of an overfitting kind of problem, because uh, throughout the number of epoch, this validation is uh, quite flattened. So that means we cannot determine about the, how many epochs we have to be executed for the training the model. So that means this one is uh, just kind of a too overfitting uh, of the model problem. So we still need to be adjusting or tuning the model a little bit further. So that means another tuning technique we are actually thinking about is what is called the regularization. In here, this one is a little bit hard for me to understand because uh, in here, the, the book says about the, we can use the L1 and L2 kind of a penalty functions, which try to regularizing and then adding the cost for the size of the load weights. So in the activation functions, actually activation function in the previous sections, we that actually allows us to the uh, value of the weights for the each between the input layer to the each node uh, as a weight. But the thing is, depending on the these kind of weight kind of functions, maybe depending on the our uh, to preventing the this kind of overfeeding problem, we actually try to give them a additional cost to our penalty to the size of the node weights. So that that means each node can be uh, can be handled equally for the each kind of a hidden layer process going through the through the model. That's the I think the L1 and L2 penalty gonna do. Okay. So how we can do this regularization? It is also very simple. We can actually just kind of define the our how we can try to do the regularizer gonna be defined in here. And then a point Usual one is the, what is called the level of tolerance for the mitigating the our kind of a overfitting kind of a problem. So this one is a kind of a minimum level of the tolerances for the overfitting kind of things. So in here, it is actually defined by the L2 as a penalty, but I'm not sure how, what is the L1 gonna be the do cause, cause L1 and L2 actually defined, but I don't know what is the differences between the, these two. So I will also try to Google it, but it is a little bit hard for me to find because I'm not familiar with these kind of uh, documents. So uh, uh, Kianto, yeah. just a comment. Yeah. Uh, you can yeah. check chapter six uh, uh, on regular regression. Uh, uh, okay. the, L1, the L1 is the, the final mistake and is the lasso. Ah, regularization and the L2 is the rich. Ah, ah, okay, in here, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. ah, okay, so L2 and L1 is the norm right. for the the penalty. Ah, Correct. okay, yeah, yeah and L1 okay, is, uh, I believe it refers to lasso, like it says there, and uh -huh. L2 is the rich. Ah, okay. Okay, is the difference between uh absolute yeah. value penalty yeah, in and here? Yeah. Yep. yeah, in here, like a Euclidean norm, and then this one right. is uh, just kind of a, another lasso penalty. Okay. Ah, okay, got you. Okay, okay, now I can understand it because he says about the L1 and L2, and then uh, I said, okay, what is this? And then uh, right. I tried to find it, and then uh, I, I did not find it. So, <laughs> oh, okay. okay, so that means okay. I can I can uh, yeah, recognize that. So this is the uh, actually lasso penalty. Uh that that, that one is rich. Uh, L2. Ah uh, L2, yeah, yeah. Rich. Yeah. Let, let me make penalty. let me make sure that you know I'm 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 doing the right thing. L2 oh, okay. yeah. uh regularization. Let me check. Uh -huh. Just in case. Ah, okay. So yeah, it's a kind of a standard kind of a deviation, a standard error yeah. kind of term. Kind yeah, of the, 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 yeah. the regression model, the regression yeah. model that uses L2 regularization is called rich. That's the yeah. rich. 
Okay. okay. And then Aaron is the lesser. So correct. Yeah. Okay. And then depending on the this kind of a weight, we can actually give the penalty to the deal so that we can actually handle with each of the of the input layers or possibility of the node gonna be dealt with uh, equally into under the each layer process. So right, uh, the, you know, just, yeah. just to just to make sure that we understand the difference, the main difference between L one and L two mm -hmm. is that the L one, the lasso, mm -hmm. uh, shrinks. You know the you know the 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 the, the collinear you know uh, features etc. Oh, it, okay. It, it, it shrinks to zero. Okay, so it's mm. a, it could be used as a metaphor for feature selection. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The ridge, right. the ridge, it tends towards zero, but it doesn't reach zero. Oh, okay? yeah. Okay, so so decent, there's still yeah. that, there's going to still be a weight there, but it's going to be very small. But it won't mm. it, won't, it won't discard any 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 of the of the features. In this case, the input the input layer. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the input yeah. layer is a is a is a you know it's a programmatic reflection of the of the features that, that you have. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you do the regression normally, you know, mm -hmm. other deep and network. Mm -hmm. If you do lasso, mm -hmm. probably if you have twenty features, maybe you will end up with uh, twelve. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, features because the other eight are discarded as mm -hmm. you know not not necessary by mm -hmm. the by the cost. In the ridge, they're going to have those 20. Okay. It's not going to do any feature selection, but then they're going to have some weights. And some of, of the weights are going to be very small. Mm. Okay. In other words, the importance of those features is going to be very small. Mm. Okay. So okay. maybe that's the difference because they're uh -huh. using the ridge, they're going to stay with all the uh, input features. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's uh, understandable. Because mm -hmm. we need all the features, we don't want to discard anyone. Yeah. Okay. Right. But we just want to do is regularize those weights. Okay. Yeah. So to see which are the ones that are more important than others. All right. Okay. Okay. That's just so yeah. to keep the, all the features. That yeah, it keeps all the features. It, yeah. Like uh, our our tolerance level gonna be the minimized. Yeah. That okay. that that's the penalty. That, that okay. number that you want oh. secret is the penalty, 0. 0.00. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, the greater that number, yeah. the greater that yeah. number, the stronger yeah. the penalty is going to be. Yeah, right. Strong penalty going to be the discarding the sum of the features going to be happening. So, okay. Okay. And now I can understand, fully understand this yep. one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So. Okay. Yeah, and this one is a kernel regularization. So that's the, how it works for the regularization process in here. And then, yeah, because in here, it is uh, mentioned about the, another thing we can also try to do the uh, do this regularization is a dropout. So it is one of the most common efficient use of person minimizing the overfitting by using the actual leader in the randomly drop out setting to the zero, the number of output features. So that means we actually decreasing about the output layers uh, uh, outcome. And then that can be also kind of a possible to, to, the, to the regularization kind of a process, like a randomly removing the different nodes. We can actually preventing the model from the, like a, some kind of a noises that is not significant. So that's the, how we can drop out. So literally dropping out the node to process, that's the, how we can uh, setting up like this, like a, that means like, a, I personally think that this one is a kind of like 20% of the node gonna be the dropout to the understanding the, these kind of a, more like a efficiency and then act to improve the accuracy of the, our outcome. So rule of thumb is the dropout rate is the 0.2 up to the 0.5, but depending on the on the data set, and then we can actually setting up the dead dropout rate as a kind of a, this kind of arguments. Like a rate is a 0.2 is the 20% of the our node cannot be considered uh, in this kind of a layer under the, this kind of a, under the layer conditions. 
but it's still depending on our quality of the data set. So whenever we actually regularize these things, we can actually find that about the, okay, now we can find that the batch normalization and then the dropout gonna be give us to the minimum validation error, which is the most fit of fit, goodness of um, model with the goodness of the fit like this. So we can maybe choose these kind of approaches when we try to do the just kind of a no tuning and then a batch normalization gonna be added as a tuning and then both dropout and then a batch normalization gonna be used with the baseline. This one actually give us about the minimum level of the validation errors. So that's the how this one works and then how we can tune in. And then adjusting the running rate is the whenever we actually going through the this kind of a parameter adjustment and then calculating the loss functions, we actually get to the local minimum. But the thing is, our goal is to kind of a get to the very, very minimum level of the this loss function, which is the get to the global minimum, like get to the very down to the bottom. How we can do these kind of things, like a different optimizer using, because uh, in the previous section, we actually used the default optimizer, but we, by using the different optimizer, we can try to do this, or maybe adjusting the learning rates for the factor of the two to 10, once validation loss is the stop improving. So that's the kind of things we can do. So how we can do these things is uh, kind of like, uh, in here, batch normalization and dropout is the define and then fit the model in here. And then at the bottom, we actually try to, when in the modeling part, we actually try to do the this callback kind of options. Like earliest option is the patience is the five, that is actually factor like a between the two to 10. And then uh, reduced to kind of a flatter means the factor is a 0.05, which means the whenever we have a, this kind of a, this one maybe I will say about the accuracy function, like we can actually get to the point for the this flatten out kind of point. We can actually stop in those kind of a training kind of a model, okay? So that's the how this one works. And then whenever we calculating these things, so you can see that this one gonna be, when we get to the very bottom point, we actually cut the cut the our model. And then we can calculate those two, two loss and accuracy functions as a plot like this. Okay, now, the next thing is after the tuning one is now we have to do is a kind of a grid search, which is the pretty similar to the previous our machine learning techniques. And then we just uh, try to setting up the setting up the plaque for the keras in this case. So that's the, how we can do with the grid search. So that means in here we actually try to do the do the flag, like a number of nodes, and then a drop out rate, and then a learning parameter, like an optimizer setting up, and then a, a, some of the learning rates gonna be setting up, and then we can try to try to find out the, which one, which model cases gonna be give us to the very low, lower kind of a functions, right? Right, this, right? So, and then, we can actually calculate the all of the, these kind of a uh, uh, grid search output, and then we can actually finalize about the how many nodes, what's the dropout rates, what kind of optimizers, what kind of a learning rates, or what kind of a regulation things or tuning techniques we have to consider to optimizing the our DNN output. That's the how grid search is about, and then we can, by setting up the list of the, these flag kind of functions, we can finally find about the uh, conditions that allows us to get to the minimum loss functions. That's the how grid search is about, right? It is also the same thing for the deep learning, like especially for the deep neural network kind of process.
So I think that, oh, I think that this is it because the final thought is just kind of a, just kind of a generalized of the, just kind of a brief summary of the, this deep learning or dual neural network. So in here, training network is uh, quite slow since the runtime requires about the number of observation and features and hidden nodes and then the epoch and then those kind of uh, some of the tuning setup, actually computation is very intensive. But now we have a very good computer. So now we can do the these kind of a very complicated process in our personal computer to get the value. So which is the very good for us. So I think that this is it. And then uh, this is the end. Uh, end of the end of the chapter.